Well, um, Annie Besant and Led Beta seem to be the main input into Krishnamati. And finding Krishnamati seems to have been in keeping with the understanding that Blavatsky and Olcott had as regards the enlightened person returning to the planet. A reincarnation of in the line of uh, Krishna and Jesus. They spent, that is Besant, Annie Besant, and Leadbeater, some 20 years input into Krishnamurti, and of course, um, the result was that he actually left the Theosophical Society. If you think about it, this was in keeping with what the expectation would be, although they didn't realise it. Namely that you divorce involvement in the world to find by your own experience familiarity with the unmanifest. Of course, um, Krishnamurti came up with a view of in divine intelligence which was in some ways not too divine. Rather similar to the Buddhist view and rather similar to what we might want to classify as philosophical view. Certainly in itself believing that it's transcending worldly religions and is indeed taking out the essence of such, which is of course what Elena Blavatsky and Colonel Elcott were about. It's possibly not that you want the Theosophical Society to change the world sort of en masse to enlightenment. For enlightenment, it's argued, doesn't come by anything other than much experience of many different lives. So in some sense it shouldn't be it, to be consistent with their understanding, which is an Eastern view, really, that you're here to change the world. Uh, and that would be so from a, a Western view too of religion that basically sees it as the individual. To expect the world to be changed, or even one particular nation to be changed en masse, um, is more of a sort of ancient Hebrew view of, um, well, not ancient, well, hmm, uh, a historical Hebrew view of the nation sort of being upgraded en masse. Theosophy is not, not going to do that. It will much improve, as hopefully any religious surgeons might achieve, the general level of sensitivity to what we might term spiritual things. But 
in some sense, to move to a massively enlightened planet in a short space of time would mean that planets evolve uh, if you like, rather quicker than <laughs> individuals. <laughs> I mean, some individuals by both Eastern, for instance, Zen especially, and um, Western, um, the Jesus story of um, those that have ears to hear, they are ideally transformed by the teachings. But to suppose that the Theosophical Society is going to spiritually revolutionise the world is um, hardly in keeping with any common view that you could sift from the religions of the world in general. What is particular is that Theosophical Society were envisaging the return of a particular individual, enlightened, in the line of, as they understood it, Krishna and Jesus, and they were disappointed. Because it transpired, didn't it, really, that the prodigal son still had to go off, you know, in terms of Christian religion. And that's exactly what Krishnamurti did, but of course he didn't return to the theosophical fold. In some sense, they weren't enlightened enough to listen to him. And from their point of view, he wasn't enlightened because he'd rejected them. But that's not the acid test of enlightenment, the fact that you go off. I mean... You may stay off for, um, well, sort of indefinitely. Certainly longer than one lifetime. You know, the fact that Krishnamurti didn't either return to the fold or achieve enlightenment in their view in this lifetime should have been anticipated <laughs> as perfectly normal. It's like the fact that he did go off. I mean, yes, it's necessary to go off. And if the prodigal comes back, he's better than when he went, dramatically. From the theosophical point of view, he didn't return. I don't know if really from Krishnamurti's point of view, he thought he was enlightened. And that's why he went off, or he just felt he was enlightened to the extent that he realised he had to go off. But that didn't mean he was going to be fully enlightened. So we have it that the view of um, the early theosophists as regards the return of um, an enlightened one to the planet Could well be right, but it might not be apparent for a few hundred years <laughs> till the story is written fully as to the consequence of his visit. It's not that the whole world flocked to Jesus. In the world you'll have persecution. I pray not for the world. I mean. Goodness, in, in that story, Jesus is not expecting it. He's just concerned with those that have ears to hear. And Krishna seems quite clear that um, Arjuna should kill the enemy. <laughs> oh, there's nothing about Ahimsa, apparently. And those that do don't believe in God. I mean, oh my goodness. Uh, that would be the Buddhist.
Buddhist religion anyway. Well, we don't want a resurrection of the policy of grooming a particular uh, future incarnated enlightened one. So we're obviously not up to recognizing the enlightened one if he comes, which is not surprising, of course, because, well, that's our great need. We're not enlightened enough to recognize him. I don't know if that was so in the Krishna story, but it was certainly so in the Jesus one. You've got to be outstanding to write a story that's going to be equal to the Bhagavad Gita. Leave alone the rest of the literature. Or John's Gospel. Leave alone the rest of the literature in their respective religions. And are we really boasting that we've got members at present who are that in touch with universal intelligence to be able to match a story like Krishna or Jesus. I don't think so. I don't want to be unkind about it. But we're just not up to it. Let me say in all humility, <laughs> for us all, we are not up to it. We have no indication that any of our members are that enlightened. No matter which masters you're thinking of in the history of what we've got none of us seem to be in effective communication with such to be sure of such a policy so it's not that um The theory is wrong as regards a possible return of um, a totally enlightened one. It's just that if it happens, you probably won't know about it until a few hundred years afterwards. There won't be that much instant response locally <laughs> and your chances of training someone up that is going to be the saviour of the world it's a strange thing to say because you would think a saviour of the world comes ready made he's already got enlightenment um Goodness, you don't even have to feed him if you think about it. And this is a strange thing about something like the Jesus story, isn't it? I mean, he grew in stature and favour with man and God. And you think, hang on, he's... didn't he come ready-made? And if he doesn't, in some sense, you expect a pattern of behaviour where he does indeed break with everything that's, if you like, um, not up to it in the world in order to contemplate the unmanifest. Let me pause a sec, return to the beginning of this recording. Religions of the world are definitely not. Um, recognized by some 
equivalents of theology or philosophy. They have an equivalence of ethics in great measure. In other words, they have a value system that's in large measure consistent. I mean, some agree with killing the enemy and others agree with sacrifice and some even think that not believing in God at all is is fine, <laughs> is right. If your policy is going to be driven by understanding, which I might point out is much of Krishnamurti's view, then you'd have to get your understanding right. But if your policy is going to be driven by ethics, loving kindness, integrity, yeah, I mean, we all know the list of good ethics, don't we? Almost any culture hopefully can come up with that, even if it's up to its eyes in debauchery. <laughs> I mean, it still knows what would be right. It's a bit like the man in the street. You can ask him, if you thought God existed, sorry, if God did exist, what do you think he'd be like? They give you the same description. Oh, he's going to be uh, friendly, kind, you know, good, um, noble, honest, reliable, high integrity, um, compassionate. I mean, most of them can tell you the character of God even though they don't believe he exists. That's where the commonality is of view across religions. You know, it's not right to kill your parents. Don't go around eating your enemies. I mean, the ethics has come from a, what we call civilization. And, uh, hmm, yeah, well, we can look at history and we can see that some peoples were less civilised than others and probably couldn't come up with quite the same good view of the divine, God, whatever. What you do as a society that's wanting to be in keeping with the universal intelligence. Goodness, that doesn't sound very friendly. I'd rather say the love of God. <laughs> um, but anyway, whichever one you go for, it's on almost infinitely safer ground to do what they think is right. Loving kindness. You know, I mean... Islam, Allah, the compassionate one, care of widows and orphans. You know, don't just step over the man who's starving in the street. Can you do anything to help? 21st century, don't wreck your planet. People starve to death if you do. Avoid war if you possibly can, but... Some enemies, they're going to wipe you out if you don't wipe them out first. What are you supposed to do? In that sense, Tibetan Buddhist is nearer to the point, isn't it? They don't want to kill, but you may have to. You may justify it philosophically on the grounds that, well, we're a more advanced uh, creature and therefore we should have priority if one of us is going to stay and one of us is going to go. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be Mickey Mouse reasoning. You're never going to be sure you're in the right. Do what's right. You know, judge righteous judgment, in the, according to the Jesus story. I mean, Krishna may advise Arjuna to kill the enemy, but most of the guitar is about 
compassionate from arrogance, exempt, exempt from love of self. I mean, just look at the list of the qualities of the enlightened one. I mean, he doesn't sound like a, a rampaging warrior, does he? And Arjuna, the prince, I mean, he's not to be meant to be someone who's not familiar with war. And yet his heart's failing him. Because Arjuna is, well, in Christian terms, he has ears to hear. <laughs> you know. And of course, Krishna gives him, you know, eyes to see and ears to hear, way beyond what is normal. And what he sees is, well, so awesome, the view of God in chapter 11, that his heart nearly fails him and says, could I just see you the way you were, please? This is too much for me. We want to feel that founders of whatever we follow got things right. But they don't. They're just people. Like us. Might be a bit better. Might not be. In their time, wow, were they enlightened. You look at the amazing impact that theosophy had on the Western world. It's quite staggering. Having said that, what is the overall state of the world today? Not clearly getting better and better. It's unbelievably bad on a massive scale. Um, you know, if, if for instance the, the British were responsible for the famines in India from 1980 to 1920, then they're the cause of one, even 200 million Indians dying that wouldn't, didn't need to have done. But for a, let me say as a, an Englishman, partly, um, historically anyway, but for our policy of economic and political policy, that, that dwarfs anything in history before or you could say since, but it's not that long ago, is it? You know, it's only in the last 120 years, 150 years. It's not clear that we are becoming more civilized. Some people are. But then there were great people way back What we classify in the West as saints, we classify in the East as know, enlightened ones, gurus. You know, what wonderful impact did Jesus make on a world scale when you consider the last century? Probably the most horrendous century the world's ever had. Certainly in data terms, the number of people that were killed and number of people in poverty and so on. 
the harm to the planet, to other creatures that are on the planet, even to the vegetation. Now we're worried that we're wrecking our atmosphere. We know what the right ethics are. But our actions are not following right ethics. They're following what we think are in accordance with pragmatic reasoning and our understanding of what we must do. It's very simple. It's our ethics that should be guiding our political and economic and social policies, not our reasoning. We are worshipping intellect, even to the extent that we are personifying the divine as universal intelligence. That's not what we value. If anything, we value universal love. I mean, simplistically, a powerful God that doesn't love me is absolute epitome of nightmare. Uh, Plato got it wrong. We don't want a society run by philosophers. We want one that's run by saints. What we value is the person who is of principle, not intellect. We may think we're the brightest person in the world, but that's not making us a saint. You know, the balmy lady is feeding the birds and has got nothing else in her life. It's doing better than most of us. Will the greatest computer that we ever build also be the most saintly? I don't think so. <laughs> if it doesn't have a concern for our welfare built into it, we're going to be in trouble. Modern man worships technology instead of loving kindness. Oh, modern man will get what he deserves then, won't he? He'll live in that sort of world. Yes, barring an enlightened one returning and rescuing us. How will he rescue us? By impressing upon us the importance of our values. What should those values be? Man in the street can tell you. Even the secular, the most scientific guy, well, perhaps especially the most scientific guy, he's worried to death, he's getting nowhere. He's brilliant and not happy. Why not? I deserve to be happy. I'm brilliant, for goodness sake. <laughs> but I'm not happy. The wife's left me. Apparently I didn't spend enough time with her, you know what I mean? He hasn't got it together.
How is the Theosophical Society going to affect the world? How did Jesus do it? How did the Jesus story do it? Well, it didn't. Well, what did it try to do it by? Impressing you that God is your heavenly dad. Abba. Father. That makes you his child. See him as the perfect heavenly dad. And you'll be a lot clearer as to what's spiritual and what isn't. See him as a genocidal, um, thundering war god that destroys all the planet but eight people. Every man, woman and child in Jericho and raise it to the ground, never to be rebuilt again and curse the person who does. And you might just go astray <laughs> if you worship such a god. What ideally does theosophy do here in the 21st century? Exactly what Blavatsky laid down. Make itself known to the world. A society of people that value loving kindness care of all life, including the planet. Values, freedom of the individual, probably. And prosperity, probably. Doesn't want mankind to be in poverty. Of course. It certainly doesn't want some people to be desperately poor. That's just terrible. Doesn't want extinctions and mistreatment of animals on the most incredible scale. It's for compassion, integrity. Hope, joy, peace. In other words, it's got to enshrine what all the other religions, more or less, tried to enshrine, which was the right ethics. And it's not too hard to see what those ethics should be. So we need to be a people of integrity, honesty, faithfulness, loving kindness, peace, hope, joy. How joyful are your members? Why not? What's missing? Is it that they're not really in fellowship? They're almost as lonely as if they weren't a member. Are they squabbling over what the society should be doing next? Oh my goodness. Get on with living, for goodness sake. Be a light in the world. And sure, pursue a policy of Letting the world know you exist. Perhaps you'll be such a haven of alternative to what they're suffering from that they'll be attracted to joining you in droves. Anyone who truly hears what you're like. What a lovely fellowship. I'd so like to be part of it. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. Oh, I mean, Heavenly Father, I mean, if you're not into the jargon, I mean, I'm following the Jesus story, all right? <laughs> Bless you. Thank you, Dad.